Okay, so we have a new episode of Legends and Leaders, and it's great to have Brandy here. Uh, you're somebody that has, um, you know, really changed the way music is today. You've written a lot of different unique pieces um, that have become iconic, and you've taken a different approach to writing, and you've crafted your own, you know, kind of very much were yourself and in, in how you wrote, and you've crafted your own lane uh, in this avenue, and you started just kind of, you know, tr- going going to a studio with rented time and trying to just learn from people, and you know, then creating some of the most um, amazing songs that have come out today. And you have your own fashion uh, fashion label. Um, you're known for what you've done in the pants space, and now you're you know really building out something as a boutique online. So I'm excited to have you here and to get into your story. Awesome, <laughs> of course. So. Where did your passion for um, music, you know, where did that kind of come from? Like, how did this passion start? And what were the first steps you took to really make it come to something that could be, you know, your career? Well, it initially started, I mean, from the time I was a little girl, I was surrounded by music. My Both sides of my family were into music. My mother was a pianist. Um, and uh, my uh, uncle was uh, head of the piano department at Juilliard. Um, every family party, everybody gathered around the piano. So there was always music going on. And uh, I just loved it at an early age. Um, I think like most artists, whether they're actors, singers, songwriters, any of the arts, something they have like pain pain that creates that need for art, you know, as a channel. Um, So, you know, I had a bit of a rough childhood, divorced parents, things like that. And music was really my go-to. That's what, you know, just made me feel good, soothed me, and uh, always had my transistor radio under my pillow growing up, (laughs) you know, grammar school. and I, at a very early age, I decided, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, I was fortunate enough, my dad, um, at a time maybe when I would have gone to college, said, you're probably not going to college. You love music so much. I have a client, and his client was Chess Records. And uh, so I got to spend a year at Chess Records. And um, had all these, you know, was uh, around all these amazing musicians, uh, got to go into recording sessions, hang out with people, talk to people. And, you know, it just kind of uh, was more proof that that's what I wanted to do. It it was inevitable. (laughs) And I got an incredible education. (laughs) (laughs) So you're around a lot of these people that are, you know, R&B artists and they're songwriters and you're able to kind of experience some of what they're doing. Um, how did you come up and, and craft your own way that you were going to create music and you know, come up with your own type of style? Like, how did that come about? Um, boy, that's an interesting question. I mean, it was just what came out of me. It's like, you know, you sit at the piano. It is what it is. Whatever comes out, comes out. Um, I always tended to go more R&B than pop or country or, you know, any other kind of music. Um, and, and, you know, probably being around chess records, my father was very involved in the civil rights movement. So I was around a lot of, uh, R&B music because of my dad. So it was kind of, yeah, inevitable that that's what I ended up. Uh, gravitating towards. Mm-hmm. So there was a point in your career, Franny, that you need to make a decision in terms of where you're going to live. And you know, LA seemed to be the best place for you to be at. How important was it moving to LA? Like, do you think you would have had the success that you had without being in LA? And you know, what were some of the major benefits right away of being moving over? Well, I went to New York for a while, and uh, and obviously I'd been in Chicago. Um, and I felt like there was so many more songwriters and opportunities in LA. Um, I got the chance to come out here when I was on a tour with my band performing, which is what I did early on. And, um, I I mean, I had never even seen like a, a, a hill, let alone a mountain, you know, being in Chicago, everything was very flat. 
Um, so I, I just was, it was so beautiful. The weather was amazing. Driving down Sunset, all you saw were like billboards of all these people you aspired to be. You know, Carol King and, and uh, uh, Carly Simon and James Taylor. I mean, all these billboards were, you know, advertising their albums. And it was like, oh, my God. So that was a pretty uh, uh, easy decision. Um, it wasn't, you know, easy to just pick up and move my whole life. But, um, you know, when you're young, you don't have much luggage. So <laughs> it was, uh, I came out here, yeah, in hmm. 80, I think it was. And so you come out there and you now are around many more people. When did you like your first kind of big break with, with your song getting picked up? Um, and, you know, you wrote a song and became successful. Like, when did that first big break happen and what kind of went into making that happen? Um, okay, so the first uh, big break came. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to, um, Carol Sager was out here. I had written with her in New York, Carol Bayer Sager. And um, she, uh, we were, we had been writing together and she said, um, I'm going to be in LA. She was out here with Martin Hamlish, I think it was. And they were working on something. We started writing. She said, you know, maybe we can use my friend's piano. Her friend was Richard Perry, the great producer, legendary. We're sitting in his living room writing. He comes home and I guess he pulls her aside and says, who's that? And within, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I was signed to his publishing company. Oh. Out of that amazing, <laughs> fortuitous opportunity, um, he hooked me up with Tom Snow, who was another writer that he had recently signed. And uh, Tom and I uh, became writing partners. The first song that we wrote was Getting Ready for Love. Richard was producing Diana Ross. And we ended up as the first single on her Baby It's Me album. And I was like, boy, this is easy. Little did I know, you know, beginner's luck. And um, yeah, I'm friends with Tom to this day. I mean, we, we wrote many, many songs together. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. How did your life change like after you had this top 10 national hit right away? Um, well, more people are aware of you, you know, it's easier for your publisher, which was Richard, not him personally, but he had his publishing company to sell you, you know, oh, I've got a new Franny Goldie song or whatever that is, you know, um, and, uh, things went okay. I had opportunities here and there. I was so fortunate to get to work and learn from some of the most amazing, iconic uh, songwriters. And, um, uh, but it was a, a while till things kicked in. You know, I was sort of new. I didn't have like a boatload of songs waiting. So I had to create a lot of songs to create a catalog. Um, I think my next big, everything uh like hits that happened were more in 83 to 86 87 things started kicking in so uh, why do you think that don't look any further you know the song that you co-wrote became like so sampled by hip-hop artists and rappers like why do you think rappers just really wanted to keep sampling that song that's a great question i would like to know the answer to that as well I mean, I think partially it was one of the first uh, R&B, well, yeah, I guess one of the first R&B songs that had like electric guitar, you know, it just, it had an amazing bass line that was undeniable. It's like when you hear Usher's Yeah, like the minute you hear that, bum, 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 you know, you, you just, it's an identifiable thing. The same thing with Don't Look Any Further, right. you know, like the baseline is so identifiable. Um, and then, you know, uh, 
puffy combs at the time. He loved it. He used it on a lot of stuff. Um, and then that whole East Coast, West Coast thing happened between Notorious B.I.G., Tupac. So it, it, mm. it kind of created history for the song and, and people took notice. Mm. So what would you say are like the fundamentals of writing a successful song? Like what are some things that always kind of remain constant um, within, you know, when you're writing? Oh, huh. Um, well, I mean, you know, hopefully, I, I mean, I always try to, well, emotion, heart, you know, hope, desperation, all the things that we go through in life. You want to be able to put all those feelings into a song so that, you know, whoever's performing it can go to that place within themselves and express, hopefully, what, you know, the writer has in mind and what they want to project. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've written, you've, you've written like all different types of uh, music. You've written, uh, you know, songs that are in major motion pictures and movies and TV shows. How different is it creating a song that's in a TV show or a movie than, you know, something that's going to be played on radio that's more designed for like, you know, or for streaming from the beginning? Nothing really. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, a song is a song. Um, I don't think there's any difference. And hopefully, whatever you write, specifically, I've only written a couple times specifically for films. Other times it was like, I'd written a song, and it was picked up by a oh. film. Um, the Top Gun song, uh, that was specifically written. Um, and, but usually it, it's kind of a song that happens to be chosen by a film to be put in. Mm -hmm. so. How much did you really know about like the context of the song for Top Gun you know, and, and the context of where it'd be used in the movie before when you were making it? Um, well, I'm trying to remember the song that they had because, you know, they'll put a song as a place holder mm -hmm. and the song was i want to say i may be wrong but i know it was a bruce springsteen song i think it was dancing in the dark i'm not sure but it was some bruce springsteen song and i'm like oh my god you know and i guess they they weren't able to get the rights or something had happened i don't know and they needed something quick I had worked with Harold Faltermeyer on other projects. We had done Vacation together with Chevy Chase and um, the original, the first movie. So I don't know. He called me and we started working on it right away. And um, yeah, that was it. I mean, very exciting. You know, you never have any idea what's going to happen with a movie or a song once you mm. put it out there, but. Boy, who knew that Top Gun would just be huge? <laughs> is there a story behind the Stick With You song that you did? Is there like a, kind of how it came about? Is there any story behind that? Um, well, I mean, not the song specifically. I mean, we wrote it um, with uh, Cassia Livingston and Robert Palmer. Um, and uh, we um we really wanted to get it to the pussycat dolls uh mm -hmm. we it, we were kind of late to the party i remember it was uh rush hour i had come home and uh i was like Ugh, i don't know i you know it's too late i heard they're done with the album it, it just it's not going to work and my husband was like no, 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 no. Go to the studio, play it for them. He, Because I had played it for my husband. He thought it was a hit. He said, just go, see what happens. And I get there, and uh, I couldn't get into the studio. They said nobody was in there. It was kind of a BS kind of thing. Um, and I left the CD and a uh, post-it note, and I just said to Ron, the producer, we've had success before, hope we'll have success again, and I left it. 
I'm on my way home, driving down Sunset. My phone rings, and I didn't recognize the number. And uh, I answer. I said, hi. Hi, it's Ron. I said, mm-hmm. oh, hi. He said, do you want to hear the good news or the bad news? I said, tell me the bad news. Bad news is we're done. You know, I planned a vacation. We're leaving next week. We're mixing the record. But we think this is a really good song for Mary J. Lodge. We're going to play it for over the weekend. Okay, great. He said, I'll look Monday. So this was a Friday. So Monday rolls around. He calls me. You want to hear the good news or the bad news? He said, tell me the bad news. Mary J., they don't like it. They don't think it's right. I said, okay. He said, but we played it for uh, Jimmy Iovine, and he loves it, thinks it's a smash. My wife is, you know, really upset, wants to, uh, I don't know if he said the word divorce, but she was very upset. Vacation canceled. We're going in the studio. We're cutting your song. Oh, my God. And I'm thinking... (laughs) They're postponing their vacation. Jimmy Iovine thinks it's, okay, this could be a single. Oh, my God. I was so excited. Um, Anyway, they recorded the song. um, And uh, the most amazing thing, because that was really my last uh, big hit. It was 2005. I get a call from Ron, and he said, uh, you got to get to the studio right away. I'm like, oh God, what happened? I had just come in for the from the gym. I rushed to the studio and you know, he's standing in front of the, the building. He's like, You're late. We are on a you know schedule. Get in here. And I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? I walk in, the sound guy, uh, the engineer pulls uh, you know, I walk in the control room, he opens the double doors, I walk into the studio. 50 piece orchestra. Oh. My heart stopped. I started crying. I was so blown away. And Ron said, I thought you'd like to be here to hear your, you know, the strings put on your song. It was unbelievable. I sat down on the floor. The guy put the headphones on me. And that was, that was just, I mean, priceless. Oh, sorry about that. Um, it was amazing. Just an amazing way to, I don't know, have my last single come out and be in the studio like that. So emotional and uh, pretty amazing. It's a great story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, how do you balance those, your time? Those are those things that happen. You know, once in a so, while, that are just, you know, priceless and that you just never forget. Definitely. So how do you balance your time between, you know, music, making clothing? Well, now you're really focusing on this on this new brand. Um, you know, how did you, even early on, like, how did you kind of find this balance? And why, why focus on clothing now? Um, it just happened by accident, very organically. Um, I was, you know mom raising funds for the school kind of thing. And I had run out of favors with my music friends. Um, You know, my my most proud moment is when I was able to get a signed guitar from Cheryl Crow, who happened to be a friend. And, but you know, after a while I couldn't get, you know, how many times can you ask for a favor? So um, I asked if I could do a boutique in the school gym and I did. And one thing led to another, and all of a sudden I started getting phone calls. My sister saw this, my mother-in-law saw that, my cousin this. Do you have any more? And um, and I and I had gotten clothes, you know, clothes and just boutiquey kinds of things. And um, by the end of the day, I was sold out. And um, I people started coming to my house. It was just like evolved and the music business was changing people were streaming there was uh you know all the uh, platforms you know spotify pandora lime lime wire is that it anyway um so 
you know, I was sort of look, I, I, I wanted something that would keep me busy. Unfortunately, at the same time, my husband was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And mm. I was completely brokenhearted. I wanted to just immerse myself in something. And there just wasn't that much happening in the music for me. Um, so I kind of put my whole self into this uh, clothing thing. And um, I started playing around with coming up with this pair of pants that I had an idea for in my head. And um, I, long story short, I created this pair of pants. Um, I had to go through all the motions of patterns, cutters, sewers, this, that, finding a manufacturer. And um, it all came together uh, slowly, but surely. And um, within a few months of going online with my new business, um, we were in O Magazine. Uh, we were dubbed The Magic Pant. And uh, the rest is sort of history, so they say. So it's very exciting. Um, I love it. I have so much fun. Um, all my friends, you know, everybody's always calling me. Um, oh, same. My mother-in-law, my sister, my <laughs> cousin, my this. Can I, you know, come out? Well, nobody can come over anymore because there's nothing here like it used to be. But uh, it, it's. I love it. I love it, and I love you know, making clothes that everybody loves, like a uniform, like, here's all you need, we, you know, and you'll feel great, you'll look great. It's a lot of fun and creative. That's awesome. It's awesome to hear that. So what do you, what's kind of your, you know, overall strategy now? What, what do you, like, what, where do you see the niche in the market that you really want to be focused on? What are you most excited about creating? Clothes-wise or, or audience or what? Clothes-wise. Close was. I'm just excited about, you know, making the perfect wardrobe that's easy. Like when I travel, for instance, all I do is an overhead suitcase and I can have enough clothes for like a couple weeks, probably even longer if I wanted to. And, you know, I, it's like I, you don't need many things, you just need great things that are easy that you feel like you look great and um, are reliable. And that's what I try to do is create like a backbone to your wardrobe. Mm -hmm. So just the last question that I have, like what are, what do you aspire to accomplish within the next, you know, five or so years? Like what is your next five years you know, look like currently? That's a good question, Ben. Let's see. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd love the company to go as far as it can. You know, you, I want those platinum and gold records, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I I would love to ease up, you know, like the people that I work with, everybody wears like 10 hats. It's, you know, I'd, I'd love to spread it out so everybody wasn't so stressed out. Because we are a small company of women and we have a blast, but it would be great if we could add a few more people. Um, I'd like to finish my memoir that I've been working on for a hundred years um, and, uh, and have more surprises, you know, just, um, yeah. I mean, last December was like incredible when, um, I was nominated to the Song of the Hall of Fame, and Bruce Springsteen cut my song Night Shift, which, I mean, you can't plan that kind of stuff. It's just, like, <laughs> magical. And so, you know, I'm hoping for more magic moments. Grateful for well, the hope... ones I have, but it's always <laughs> nice. Well, I hope you get more of those, Franny. I appreciate you coming on, and I'm excited to see your, your brand continue to grow and, you know, for it to help, you know, for it to be on many people and to um, excite people with the new styles that you bring out. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.